This is gonna take Cracker Jack timing, Wang. Total concentration. You ready, Jack? I was born ready. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. And yesterday on the channel, Eric and I went over our, you know, five favorite female comic book characters. And we thought, hey, let's, we are in the month to talk about female characters, female history. And I thought, why not bring Eric back on the channel along with Joe Corallo and maybe talk about the history of women in comic books. So obviously here we're talking to me about that is the comic book hoarder, the man so cool they call him the Bree. How you doing, Eric? I'm doing well. Also, we've got independent writer, independent editor, award-winning editor, Joe Corral. How you doing? I'm all right, Wes. How are you? I'm doing great. So I thought this would be a fun discussion. Eric and I got the creative juices flowing, just kind of talking about some characters and whatnot. Thought it would be fun to be go to kind of go into this. Now, there have been female, you know, superheroes in comics for a very long time. I believe the very first one was what's her name, Fantima, obviously. Uh, Diana Prince, Wonder Woman has been around for a long time. Joe, just kind of, what are your thoughts on the on the history? Like, it goes all the way back to the 1940s. So, since the beginning, really, of comic books and superheroes, there have been female heroes. Oh yeah, you know, um, Phantom Lady is also another favorite of mine from from the Golden Age. Um, I, I think she also premiered. It was, I think, it was 1941, maybe 42, but it was very early on. Um, yeah, there there wasn't really reasons not to do it at the time uh as, as i recall though i believe that when they were doing wonder woman the idea was they thought more women would buy it but oddly enough it had a higher percentage of men buying wonder woman than the other comics at the time and, and they weren't uh <laughs> they weren't sure what to do with that information but but yeah it's uh that there's always been an interest to get that market because you're not dealing with the direct market here you're dealing with newsstands and parents are all interested in finding ways to get their kids to leave them alone so they can read the newspaper so so there's always a, a reason to to appeal to women and to have women heroes in comics now eric obviously you've been reading comic books i believe longer than joe or i have been alive so you've been in the game for a very long time. <laughs> for a very long time, my friend. So what were your thoughts when you first started reading comic books? Were there a lot of female superheroes? Or was it mostly dominated by men with a few female superheroes here and there? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously you had Wonder Woman, yeah, who was a member of the Justice League. You had Black Canary. Over Marvel, you had um, Sue Storm, the Invisible Girl. You, you, Storm was already in the x-men when i started and and i it, like within the first year that i was reading they introduced carol danvers as ms marvel and at the time i, I didn't really give it any thought it, it didn't it wasn't oh that's a female superhero to me it was a oh that's another comic book character and i love this stuff so you know bring them on and you know i said they you know it, it didn't matter that you know really who they were or what they could do. I mean, they were, they were just, they were characters that fit alongside their male counterparts. And uh, I mean, there was some early, you know, the, 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 the feminism was a little you know, on the nose, depending on who was writing it. But a lot of times, even as far back as the seventies, they like, like Sue storm was treated as an equal storm was treated as an equal. And, and both of you, know, and like I said, storm ended up leading the X-Men. So, I mean, it was just, to me, it was just how it was supposed to be. Well, obviously, like like we mentioned, there, you know, there have been female superheroes or characters within comic books for quite a long time. Obviously, sensibilities have changed over the years. And I remember, I believe it was Gail Simone Joe that kind of got her name out there when she, I believe she started a blog, maybe a website, and she was talking about some of the inequality within the comic book industry. Specifically, I think she might have coined the term fridging. Certainly, in, in yeah. past times, one of the key creative devices you would do in a story to maybe give your protagonist motivation would be the damsel in distress like storyline. Mm -hmm. So that was certainly a part of, of comic books, you know, throughout times, you know, all the way up until, you know, even today. Yeah, no, sure. That's um that's something that's sort of been ingrained in in a lot of uh storytelling. And and that is what propelled Gail. I, I believe she's talked about this before as she was, I want to say a barber at the time. 
and, and had started this uh, blog and that got a lot of attention uh, since then I, I also believe that her and, and ron mars are more or less friends if not you know they're pleasant acquaintances and, and don't really hold the everything reason you bring up marv is because the the first big one was the kyle rayner bridging yes. in green lantern yes so yeah. so yeah so you know you, you see them interact and and uh, everything's good uh so it, it is interesting gail would go on to be uh, one of the first women to work on Wonder Woman. But the the first woman to actually draw Wonder Woman uh, was Ramona Fraden, and it, who started in the 1950s. She basically is given at least part of the credit for revamping Aquaman for the Silver Age and is uh, considered by many to be the first woman to draw uh, superhero comics it, you know there there are a lot of women who also worked in or around comics at the time but still in like the the new strip uh, capacity uh was it jackie orms uh, i think may have been doing new strips before this but aquaman was given a, a lot under ramona including what was it um she created a few characters uh, for Aquaman. I believe she created Aqualad and what was it? Uh, Aquaman's mom as well was a creation of, of Ramona. And, and she would later uh, leave, come back, do a little bit on uh, Fantastic Four. But before she left, she also co-created Metamorpho, who is this like, cool sort of cult classic kind of character that pops up in things like the brave and the bold or um it was recently featured in the terrifics yeah yeah so a to, good character. yeah she she has a long legacy and she's still around today um i don't know if she's still taking commissions or anything like that but she was up until recently and would uh, occasionally attend cons she's in her 90s though hopefully she's doing some nft work on maybe some of that original aquaman art Oh yeah, no, no, she should. I'm, I'm very lucky to have uh, some sketches from her, including an uh, Aquaman sketch. So, I, I appreciate that. So, you know, just going back into you know, uh, obviously we've had female uh, superheroes since kind of the beginning of the genre, Eric. But we've we've kind of had uh, female creators. Maybe they weren't quite as prevalent as they are today. But you know, back you know, when you started reading, or even when I was a, a kid, you wouldn't know what these people look like. So unless they had a specific name. Or whatever you probably were reading some female creators and just didn't know it yeah well by the time i started you know, creators were getting credit at the beginning of the books i mean you know in the in the 60s dc or up through the 60s dc usually did not list credits so it's very possible that they like said i you know we were reading ramona Fraden's were or seeing her art and not realizing it um, I know when I first, when I started, she was the artist on Plastic Man. So she mm -hmm. was still working and, and getting your know, name recognition for that. Um, Marie Severin was working for Marvel by the time she, you know, started, at, I believe, EC. Yeah. And uh, she and her brother were both working for Marvel in the 60s and into the 70s. Uh, not as prevalent as they had been. And I think you know, mostly uh, they were on, I think, sergeant fury but she but she her name was very well known you know through for you know by comic historians and fans of that era but um but something else the year i started something huge happened as far as women in comics jeanette khan was hired by dc to take over the company replacing carmine infantino mm -hmm. and her background she was very young i think she was 28 when they hired her no background in comics at all. In fact, she was working on a, a children's scholastic line and they brought her in to give the entire company a, a different perspective. And she did things like immediately cancel all reprint books. Mm -hmm. She wanted all new material. And of course, you know, the, the quote unquote good old boy network did not welcome her with open arms. There was a lot of snickering in the background and sniping and whatnot and older guys saying that should have been me blah 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 
And I remember she, you know, I read reading an interview and she said, most of the guys, you know, treated me poorly at first or just went along with everything I said to try to curry favor. And Paul Levis was the only person that would stand up to me and say, this, this doesn't work. And that's why, that, that's why he basically became her right-hand man. And they took DC into a direction through the crisis and basically turned them from a, I'm going to use one, you know, a word Jay used earlier, quaint comic book company to something that was producing the best work in the industry for decades under you know for, under her watch i think she was mm-hmm. there until the early 2000s and i think paul levitz took over for her but yeah her, her contribution to comics you know, cannot be you know valued enough because you, didn't she like did didn't she have a program where they were reaching out to comic book stores across the nation for them to modernize their businesses because she could say that you know that they hadn't kind of come into the the modern technology and stuff like that wasn't that her well i I, I can't say for sure, but I'm, I'm sure she had, I'm sure she played her part in getting comics into the direct market because I know, um, I think Jim Shooter was also very instrumental in that. But um, yeah, she she was definitely a forward thinker because I said her, she came at it from a business perspective. It's like you know, I just looking at it from the outside, what works and what doesn't, and I'm sure she saw the future, and the future was not newsstands and convenience store shelves because. Yeah, the the industry was changing. Yeah, and uh, what was it? I I have heard that uh, from from someone familiar with the meeting that uh, one of the people involved in the meeting where they appointed Jeanette Kahn was uh, so upset that he had to uh, excuse himself to vomit. So just to give you an <laughs> idea of how how things have changed since uh, since then, but. Uh, yeah, Jeanette Kahn, I mean, you saw a Crisis on Infinite Earths happen under her watch and uh, a lot of things that transformed uh, DC. And at the same time, you also had the rise of Karen Berger. And uh, Karen Berger and uh, Paul, uh, what was it? Because she was working under Paul at the time, were instrumental in... Uh, getting the British invasion over, including, you know, Alan Moore, Warren Ellis, uh, Grant Morrison, and uh, Brian Boland, all those guys. So so Karen under that as well, uh, at that same time, also helped revolutionize the business and then eventually went on to uh, create uh, Vertigo there. You know, what's crazy with Vertigo, uh, obviously it kind of revolutionized things at DC Comics, but Really, has there been a bigger influence just as far as comic production in our modern times in Vertigo Comics? Essentially, the entire line at, at Image is what you would have expected to be coming out of Vertigo at DC in the beginning, but they, those creators all kind of drifted over to wanting to do uh, independent creator-owned stuff so they keep the rights to, to the works. And it's kind of trickled down to Dark Horse and the other independent publishers. So the influence of Karen Berger and what she created at Vertigo as far as the British invasion and all the, uh, you know, not traditional superhero storytelling really is, is permeated throughout comic books up until today. Yeah. You know, and, and she also played a role. Um, she edited uh, Alan Moore's Swamp Thing before, you know, this is well before Vertigo mm-hmm. or Black Label. They, they changed the labeling on these uh, so many times, but it was coming out at DC proper at the time. She took over after Len Wein uh, left editorial duties on that book. Uh, she edited quite a lot of George Perez's Wonder Woman. Uh, she, she was involved in a lot. Um, she also was part of getting Mindy Newell over to DC. Mindy Newell was the first woman to uh, get credited and, and write a solo Wonder Woman story. She took over the last few issues of Wonder Woman before Crisis. And, and I say that uh, with that little caveat because it's in recent years been reported that Olivia Byrne, who uh, was, um, you know, the third in in the relationship of the uh, William, the original creator of uh, Wonder Woman, that she had contributed uh, to to some of the stories. Uh, by today's standards, there are a few issues. Uh, I don't know if we know which issues or not that she would have gotten like a co-plotter credit that she didn't actually write but the the ideas or, or whatever were talked about 
uh, amongst the two. So, so we have that, and then we have Mindy Newell, and Mindy would go on to be the first woman to write Legion of Superheroes, uh, Lois Lane, Catwoman, uh, a, a lot of characters over at uh, DC, and would co-write with George Perez on his run of Wonder Woman for about a year. Uh, so you already had a, a few women uh, writing or, or being involved because then you'd have Jill Thompson would really get her start on Wonder Woman during Perez's run. Um, and then before that, you had Trina Robbins, who's mostly an underground comics person, but she uh, illustrated and was the first woman to draw a Wonder Woman comic. Ramona Frieden drew Wonder Woman and Super Friends comics. But uh, then you'd have Trina Robbins come in. So you had a lot of women involved, particularly in, in characters like Wonder Woman, before Gail Simone's uh, fridging blog. <laughs> also, Eric, over while all of this is happening in DC Comics, at Marvel, we have maybe one of the greatest creative periods of all time. You know, you have like three or four of the greatest comic runs ever. You know, they're headlined by Chris Claremont, Walt Simonson, uh, Frank Miller, but kind of behind the scenes, on the editorial staff and also writing as well. There, there are a couple of uh, very prominent, very important women to, to comic book history over at Marvel with Louise Simonson, I believe, and Ascenti would have been behind, uh, driving force behind some of those stories as well. Yeah, they, they were the editors on Claremont's X-Men and they were the ones that, it, Claremont would get so many ideas that he would have subplots dangling for years and they would be the ones to, steer him back towards what he had intended to do so without without those two women we may not get that seminal run that we're going to be talking about for as long as they're publishing comics and Anna Senti, if i'm not mistaken started answering the phones and worked there for several years before she got any even assistant editing you know, job and she also parlayed that into a writing career of her own she took over daredevil and wrote that for years louise simonson i think she's best known for writing uh one of the superman books after the other christ i think she did man of, wrote man of steel forever and so yeah those those two were huge you know influences on the x-men run so like i said that, that that's an enormous contribution to those two and um uh john burns editor on two hulk was uh bobby chase um, and you know, Joe Duffy was around as a writer and an editor. So Marvel had a lot of you know really important contributions from the women on their staff, you know, in in, in the eighties and you know nineties. So Joe, yeah. I believe you've met Anna Senti, correct? Yeah, and I, I've heard she's she's a lovely person. Yep. What were your thoughts talking to her? You know, she's super, you know she everything that you could have imagined. You know, with all of her contributions. Oh yeah, no, she she's uh, humble, but she's also you know very uh, confident, and uh, you know uh, she's she's great. She's uh, you know she's from a hip kind of person, uh, has no problem telling you how she feels about things. Uh, she's she's really great. Uh, same thing with Wheezy. Uh, I mean, Wheezy is one of the nicest people you'll ever meet in comics. Uh, she is far too humble. Uh, I, I've met her on multiple occasions. I've been on a panel with Wheezy. Um, one of the cons I saw her at, you know, she was talking about if she should have a banner since everyone has those, you know, like pull-up banners behind mm -hmm. them at the cons. And she was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if anyone really care if I had like a, a banner or what, what I'd even put on it. You know, we, we had a long talk about that because, you know, I was telling her like, well, you get a banner and you put apocalypse cable and steel on it you co-create all those characters people know who those characters are and like people would like that you know she's she, she's someone else her her contributions she's more than happy to gush over everything she's done whether it's writing or editing and uh, she was the first woman at DC to get a regular writing gig. Prior to that, women were writing, you know, they'd write in fill-in issues, they'd co-write, they'd 
you know, sort of they do mini series, things like that. But getting the green light to from issue one launch a series wasn't something that happened with women uh, at DC at the time. And it was only a month later where that happened for the second time at DC with Nancy Collins taking over Swamp Thing. Swamp and this yeah. this is all in 92 or 90, maybe, maybe it was 91. But so at that I, point, comics yeah. have kind of been a thing for you know, over 50 years. <laughs> it took quite a while to get there. We, we yeah. talked about there's, there's been heroes since the beginning. There's been contrib mm -hmm. contributors since the beginning. You know, you, you've talked to a lot of creators, a lot of people that have been around. What was the environment like? What did these women have to endure to finally break that glass ceiling when Louise Simonson did that at DC Comics and pave the way for the creators that we have today? I mean, a lot of that was just, a lot of it was sticking it out. A lot of it was being there and uh, continuing to work. You, you also saw some of that was helped by people like Karen Berger and Jeanette Kahn getting into those positions and being able to, you know, hire certain people. Also getting and, in the, those positions and performing well. Oh, of course. Yeah, no, that, that, that's without question. But you even look back, there, there were a lot of women who also worked in different aspects of comics. Um, I, I talked uh, to Perch with uh, Martha Thomas's the other day, and she was uh, head of the uh, PR for the book market for DC in the 90s, and also created uh, co-created and wrote Dakota North at Marvel. But you go back in the 70s, you had uh, Glynis Oliver, also known as Glynis Ween, who was a colorist. And you might not have realized it reading comics, but she was the colorist on the majority of Claremont's run. She started around issue 113 and did most of Uncanny straight through 300. She was the colorist for most of New Mutants. The colorist for most, uh, most if not all of Roger Stern's Amazing Spider-Man run. Uh, same thing with m a lot of Marv Wolfman and most of John Byrne's Fantastic Four run. Uh, Len Wein's uh, Spider-Man run. Like you, you have without question read comics that uh, Glynis Oliver, Glynis Wein uh, had colored. Uh, same thing with Lynn Varley. Uh, she was uh, the colorist on, you know, The Dark Knight Returns and, you know, amongst many other things. But it's hard to find big comics fans that like Batman that haven't read that comic. And, and you know, she colored it. Mm -hmm. The comics also changed a lot. This is a video for another day. But colorists were really considered part of production and not creative for a long time which is why when you read a lot of uh, particularly, uh, you know, older Marvel comics and, and DC, but you look through, the letters were often credited without the colorist. And then when they did start adding the colorist, the letter used to be above the, the colorist. So, so that's also been an interesting transformation too. No, certainly. So, Eric, you, we're kind of getting more into the modern times. Obviously, we, we talk about all these these great creators that kind of paved the way. And there's certainly a lot, it feels like there's a lot more female creators within comics today. A lot less frigid. You know, they, they, <laughs> a little bit less of the the, uh, the damsel in distress storyline. Uh, have you welcomed this change? What do you think about the, the new wave of female creators, female characters that we've been getting lately? Well, I'm, I'm I'm fine with it as as long as they you know, remain true to what it remain true to the industry to the hobby itself, and you know some do, and admittedly some do not. And I, and I do want to say that, and I know a lot of this is just social media babble, but the idea that women you know, didn't break into comics until either Gail Simone, depending on who you asked, or until the milkshake incident, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think does a disservice to all the women that came before them who did make it possible for them to have, you know, the success they have today. 
And I think that because with the people we've been talking about, you know, comics was a tough business to break into for most people, whether you were a man or a woman, certainly harder for women because that's just the way it was. So when you realize how good these women were at what they did to get to the positions where they were, and I think that needs to be remembered, you know, more so because without them, yeah, I'm not saying that none of these women that are that are working comics today would be where they are, but they definitely owe them a debt of gratitude that you know can never be repaid because I said some of the best creators and people in the industry from the day I started have been women, and that you know, needs to be mentioned from time to time. Less people. Does it get. disappoint you, Eric? Like they do a lot of these anthologies to celebrate, you know, history and things. When, we haven't really seen a women's history anthology bring back a lot of these creators. They're still around. You could get Karen Berger probably to put together some type of anthology with, with the works of, of some of these creators that are still around that are still ready to tell stories. But it, it, it does feel like they kind of forget about it. Well, it, yeah, it's I, I, the modern co comic book industry it doesn't really have any kind of reverence for its past, be it male or female the characters or, or whatnot it's 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 almost like they treat the industry as if as if it's just a handful of years old i know that marvel just did some kind of book you know by women for women and they got louise simonson to write the introduction why not a story i don't know if they asked her and she said and she said no but i mean i i would you know, think that you would want to get because they're they're almost all still around Mm -hmm. And w I'm sure would be willing to contribute, but it seems like the industry, it's, it's like all industry yet. You, they tend to move on from the past instead of mining the past to help with the present and the future. It's almost like they want to just divorce themselves from it. it like I said, be it male or female, because there are plenty of male creators that can't get in the door at the big two anymore either that could write and draw circles around the people that are working there today. Do you have anything, <clears throat> any thoughts on that, Joe? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it's always been tough to break in no, no matter who you are in a lot of cases, no matter who, you know, uh, there are uh, a lot of women working today. Uh, it's, you you do always wish there was more reverence for for the people that came before uh s some of them may not be interested in coming back uh, a lot of them are uh there we're, we've you know talked to plenty or seen plenty on you know social media or or uh, in interviews are very willing to come back um you, you know uh what was it rachel pollock would be more than happy to come back and, and do a little doom patrol if, if people wanted to do it um but but like you pointed out, uh, Wheezy, uh, Annie Nocenti, people like that, they're still getting some work. Uh, Devin Grayson, you know, sometimes it's an anthology. Sometimes it's, you know, uh, Karen Berger has been working with uh, Annie at Dark Horse. Uh, Wheezy gets certain assignments. I think she recently did like a Wonder Woman uh, book for like Walmart or something like that. She's got X-Men Legends coming yeah. up with Walt where they're doing some X factor stuff. Yeah. And, and Annie uh, was doing some of that too. So, so maybe uh, to an extent people have been listening because we're, we are seeing a little bit of an uptick on, on these things recently. So, mm -hmm. so that's always good. Uh, the coloring part gets tough because they changed to digital. I, I don't know if uh, a lot of the women like Glynis or Lynn uh, would be able to work in in coloring because of the the big changes since then but yeah it's important to acknowledge that these things have happened in, in the past and uh to honor that as opposed to uh, acting like everything is is new uh when a lot of times it isn't you know what's interesting you know we're talking about a lot about writers here and you know you're talking about some colorists but really a lot of the most exciting comic book artists like the front page artists are women right now like peach momoko she just had her x-men demon days one of the most popular you know cover artists in the world right now 
fantastic artists. We got Stephanie Hans, who I personally I think she she's more of like uh, uses a painted style, but like her work on Die with uh, Kieran Gillen is like it's mind blowing. Some of the stuff she comes up with just as far as her character or creature designs and whatnot. So there's certainly been some glass ceilings broken, and there are a lot of phenomenal comic book artists right now that are that are female. Hopefully, we'll get some more. Do you think? Do you see those opportunities keeping to keep kind of growing in the in the industry, Joe? Because it feels like the the art, the writing opportunities seem to be growing, but maybe not the the actual artist opportunities. It depends. Uh, there are uh, a few high pro uh, higher higher profile women, um, specifically cover artists like Peach Momoko, like Jim Bartel, uh, Jenny Frizen. Um, you know, we, we just saw Peach Momoko's uh, first interiors at Marvel the other week, uh, which, which were pretty solid. Uh, I, I think she did a good job. And, you know, there, there's other colorists too, like uh, Tamara Von Villain and uh, Laura Allred, uh, people like that also working. Laura but... Martin's maybe the best colorist in the industry, probably. Yeah, Laura, Laura Martin is absolutely wonderful. Uh, but yeah, there there are women that do line work. I, I've worked with Ava Cabrera uh, before, uh, Claudia Guir, uh, and they've also both have um, you know Archie credits and and uh, some other credits at smaller publishers. But but yeah, I, I think there will still continue to be a demand. A lot of it is making sure you know that people are aware they're around, meeting deadlines, things like that. There are probably more openings honestly, for artists than, than there are for writers. Uh, mm -hmm. So so if you're an exceptionally good artist, it's a lot easier to get noticed and, and get picked up because, uh, you know, they're always looking for uh, people to come in if people are falling behind on their deadlines or, you know, anything like that. And you still see some work from, you know, even people like, you know, Jill Thompson, uh, Colleen Doran, and, and, and people like that uh, who, who had a major impact. Uh, Aletha E. Martinez, uh, still doing uh, work, and, and she's been doing stuff since the '90s as, as well. So, so yeah, I, I think there are those opportunities. So, one of the things we obviously in, in the current times, Eric, the, the current female the writer for Detective Comics is, is female. Uh, a, a good portion of the writers on the X Men line are, are female. The one of the lead creators on the last X Men event was was Tinny Howard, obviously female. So, it feels like. They are getting higher profile gigs. What are your thoughts? Is it still a good old boy network kind of behind the scenes as well? Or do you think that's completely been disposed of? If it hasn't been, it's on the way to being because I think we are at a point where it's, I'm not going to say it's, it's beneficial to have more women writing, but I think we're at the point now where I think comics would like to get, needs to get to the point to where you you no longer notice the gender of the creator now right now we are in a we're in a we're in a time where they want you to know that seem seemingly before it's before you find out whether or not the work holds up but i think eventually yeah you know, the industry will get to a point to where it doesn't matter and that's that's when you'll have true equality when you're not even looking to see where well, you're looking to see who wrote the book because you liked the creator, but you could care less whether it's a man or a woman. And I think we're, you know, we're on the way to getting to that point. Joe, obviously you're, you're in the industry. Do you think we're, we're almost to the point where it's a complete meritocracy and the good old boy network isn't quite as prevalent as it was back in the day. You can still see it. There, there's certainly some, some creators you're like, there's no reason for that person to be on that book if they didn't know somebody important. But it feels less and less nowadays. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that that's always going to be there to an extent. Uh, even if the, you know, uh, Old Boys Network's gone, it, it will be replaced by other networks because that's just how these things work. <laughs> Editors reach out to people uh, they know or are familiar with or recommended by people they know, especially in a pinch. If you need a fill-in artist on a book that's late, you don't have the luxury to hold weeks of interviews and look over the portfolios of dozens of people and make the best choice. You have to you know, pull the trigger and be like, okay, who do you got? Uh, they look good, get it out the door. 
so so there is that element to it that's going to be hard to break almost no matter what however part of those issues and those frustrations i think some people have it's less the actual content and more the marketing and once marketing changes and it's not just the companies it's the news outlets websites cover certain things you have to get to a point, the collective you, uh, where we're no longer treating all of these instances like they're the only reason you should buy a comic or check it out. And that's hard to break because the publishers are now trained that the oh, gender the identity of the of the creator is the headline mm -hmm. rather than the story idea behind it. Sure, you know, there, there are plenty of other things too. It's not just that, but, yeah, yeah. You, you know, they, they're they trained that if you want the free press for this, you know, if you want, you know, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, you know, the New York Times cover this, you, you have to present it in a way where they will. And that's been a way that they do. So now they're trained, okay, well, when we do this, we know that we're going to get these kind of, headlines we're going to get this kind of buzz and once that stops happening you'll see publishers doing it less because they're not getting the free press out of it so so that's part of it too and that's that's difficult because the publishers and the creators have no control over that that's you know they can't demand you have to cover this it's free press so that's a tricky situation that there's no easy answer for, but but that's just sort of the reality we live in. But I think we're, we're certainly closer to that today than we were probably five years ago, much closer than we were 15 years ago and you know, light years ahead than we were 50 years ago. So it's been a very interesting uh, time, obviously, for, for women in comic books. We are in Women's History Month. Eric, is there any like one last creator or character or a story that you want to talk about kind of before we wrap this up? That was just important to you as far as women in comic books. No, I, th I think the the one that meant the most to me was you know, Jeanette Khan being hired at DC. So that's you know, and, and I did cover that. Um, so I, th I think we pretty much she certainly you know, led the way to like a Diane Nelson, essentially being the president of DC Comics later on, and she made a lot of huge huge uh, changes over at DC. So you know, glass ceilings broken, and now I believe. Even some of the executives that that are, are even higher than DC, they're up in Warner Media now. Yeah, I, I, I think we're to the point. We're we're getting to the point in the industry where, yeah, you know, when we get past the hiring somebody for a book because they look like the character or have the same you know gender identity or sexual orientation as a character, and we realize that you know c creator A can do character B, and vice versa. You know, because Joe brought up a great point. If you want to get mentioned in certain outlets, you have to give them something that they can, you know, get people to notice by their by their byline. But what that what that doesn't do is guarantee sales. So if we can get to the point to where the best people are again, you know, you put the best people on the on the books and let the public decide. I think you know when we get you know all the way to that point. Yeah, I, I think that's you're going to find out that uh, when, when you look to see who's doing what, it's going to be a nice, you know, nice mix of, you know, men and women. And that's what the industry needs going forward. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, is there like uh, maybe a story that you had or maybe somebody you wanted to mention, but we it didn't come up yet that before we kind of wrap this up, just as far as women in comic books, as far as the history? Uh, one other thing, I think I may have mentioned this on a, a live stream the other week, but um, Linda Fight, who is uh, Herb Trimpey's wife, uh, wrote uh, The Cat at Marvel back in 1972. Uh, Marie Severin was the uh, layout artist on that. And Ramona Fraden was actually going to take over if it went to issue five on issue five, but it never happened. This was an effort by Stanley and, and Roy Thomas to create a new woman superhero with women working on the book to sell it to women. This isn't new. This ha this is 49 years ago. This this happened. 
I, I, I think it's important for, for people to understand that the, these things have been happening. Um, the, that particular effort only lasted four issues. Uh, there's, there's multiple factors for, for things like that. I, I think it's a disservice when people brush off particular characters or, or things like that over, you know, maybe the sales not being there and being canceled too soon when there are different ways to approach these things. We've, we've certainly seen, uh, you know, similar types of, of characters and setups with, you know, women uh, working as writer artist on books that have been much more successful. And, you know, sort of to, to end this, uh, on my end, at least, I, I think there are also creators like Mariko Tamaki, who started uh, as a playwright and went on to do graphic novels like Skim with her cousin Jillian. Uh, that's where I first noticed her uh, before this one summer. Uh, to be able to go from that realm and to write successfully for that audience, to then do a pretty decent job on something like Detective Comics is a feat. And, and I think people get caught up in, in some of the negatives uh, around that, but there are not a lot of writers that can write something like this one summer and Detective Comics. So, so I do think that's worth noting and, and that, and there are uh, a lot of other women out there uh, like Mariko who can balance both. Uh, there are a lot of incredibly talented, you know, women writers and artists that we may never know because there's just no room to break in at the big two there's only so many slots but but yeah they're they're out there they're they're creating uh, some great work and you know you could, should do yourself a favor and uh, check out some women in comics that you don't know i do want to say thank you very much to both my guests eric Breen and joe corral i think we had a good discussion were we able to cover everything absolutely not that's over 80 years of history to, to try and cover. But I think we covered some some very, some very key characters, key, key moments, some key players as far as creators, executives throughout the history, kind of all the way up until we are today. So hopefully if, if maybe people learn something, they can go find a comic book they weren't even aware was out there. But, you know, that's that's our very short attempt at, at talking about the, the history of women in comics. Obviously, it's much broader than what we were able to accomplish here. But I think uh, I think it was a good good discussion. I hope people enjoy it.